Okay. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, portions of Chapter 3. Part of it is shown via the console, and we're, we're done doing the console, so, uh, but I will uh, refer to the code so you see how to do it. Now, um, last time we talked about um, uh, some of the graphical um, elements, the GUI. Uh, so we got a JTEX field. So let's go ahead and get, a, get something set up there so we have something to work with when we get to the code. Okay, so I'm going to come over here. I'm going to do file, new project, Java Maven, Java application. And um, the example two. Over here, I'll expand this, uh, expand storage packages, and um, I'll create uh, the under here the Kali GUI uh, example too. If I right click on that, choose new, and then uh, choose J frame form. And um, uh, main window, give it some kind of name. You'll find that they have conventions that they say you should follow for that, though there is no um, set in stone on it. Up here, remember, you got your design, you got your source. And if I come up here, click the source, you'll see that up here they got something called public class main window. Um, so this name of this Java file matches the name of the class right here. Um, in some cases, I'm not sure if NetBeans would be smart enough to handle it for you, but if you tried to rename uh, rename this, then it would break because these names have to match. Um, so, okay, go back to design. Um, I'm going to drop a label on here. Drop another label on there. Text field. Where's text field? Um, there it is. Text field. And uh, then a, oh, another label. Another text field. A button. And uh, put a label here and label here. Okay, so I'm um, not going to uh, put anything on those yet. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing something with those here shortly. Chapter 3, Input and Output. There's a system class. System is a class that provides methods related to the system or environment program drawn. System.out is a special value that provides methods for displaying output, including print line. System.out is a print stream, which is defined in a package called Java.io. Uh, package is a collection of related classes. Java.io contains classes for input output, which, well, IO, which stands for input and output. Now, these print lines that they're referring to here. Um, these what you wouldn't run these in a GUI. You'd run these in the console, like that first thing, "Hello World." Uh, I had you take a look at. Um, see the system dot out dot print line. Um, this will print that string there, and then go down the next line. Well, um, all of this then is descended. Here's system dot Java, and here's print stream dot Java. And um, you see here it says public final static print stream out under system.java. And then it says public void print line. So here's the definition of it down here. So when you bring in um, code, some of it's brought in directly for you. 
Uh, some of it you do an import. We'll do an import on the random numbers here shortly. Um, that's where we're headed with that uh, application. This is the very last slide here. Talks about how to do random numbers, and we're going to create a little little tutorial um, such that when they click a button, it'll generate random numbers, and then they'll guess what the answer is, and then we'll tell them if they got it right or not. Okay, scanner class, uh, system class also provides special value system.in, which is an input stream, provides methods for reading input from the keyboard. Scanner is a class that provides methods for inputting words, numbers, and other data. Scanner is provided by java.util, which is a package that contains classes so useful they are called utility classes. When you see the word classes, uh, think code, uh, libraries that somebody else has written, code to do something. Um, there's a um, movie called The Matrix. I, I love the movie. Um, I don't love it for the violence. Um, I think people like it for the wrong reasons. Uh, but if, you have, if, you're, if you're a computer science type person, you got to love the movie. Um, because uh, the whole premise is, and not to ruin it, you know, mute me right now or silence me if, you, if you're planning on watching tonight. Um, <laughs> it's been around since what, 80s or 90s or whatever. Um, but the um, whole premise is people live in this computer uh, program. Um, so they're plugged in. Um, so their conscience or whatever, um, brain or whatever is hardwired into this big computer program. And with that computer program, uh, the agents that are running around can change and take control of any, any object, any person in that world. Um, well, there's one scene where Trinity is up on the roof, and, and uh, there's, a, I think, a helicopter up there, and I and, um, can't remember the guy's name, uh, Keanu Reeves, but I, I can't think what his name is in the movie. <laughs> he says, uh, can you fly that? And, and she says, I will shortly, and uh, she has the, the person load in uh, like a library for her to learn how to, how to run that helicopter. Well, that's the idea here is um, you import a library to know, know how to run a helicopter. Um, that's exactly what these classes are, that they're talking about are. They're not as exciting as a uh, flying helicopter. Um, generally, if you're writing a, a console program, how to use a scanner, you have to import like this, import java.util.scanner. Create a scanner. This is um, object oriented. Oops. I was trying, trying to highlight it, I moved it instead. Um, this is object oriented. Scanner in equals new scanner system dot in. Um, to understand a little bit about object oriented, we'll talk about it more in the, later in the class. Uh, they'll become more, more, more and more important in various aspects. I could define, for example, a human. Well, a human has a name. Um, a human has a um, they got blood type. I used to put gender up there, but I'm not sure if I <laughs> used to have a gender. Um, there's so many variations that anymore. I don't, I don't even know how I could list them. Um, okay. Now that's a generic definition of a human. So then I create a new instance of it. Now notice here, we put scanner first, and then in equals new scanner. This is a general general format. Human David equals new human. So I walk into Walmart. And the computer program, uh, the matrix um, of Walmart, uh, creates a new instance called David. Um, somehow it knows my first name. It'll put a microchip under my skin or something. Say, so, you know, I'm in the store. Um, from then, they can assign different different items. And we're going to see different ways of doing this. But just a very um, crude way is you do the, your instance name, which is David, dot... And then the name here refers to this right here, this attribute. And that's equal to David Hayes. 
I have no clue what a blood type is. I would say it's O if that's a valid for a blood type. And David, uh, gender equals male. My wife walks in. Her name's Sherry. So it creates a new instance. And Sherry's name is Sherry Hayes. Sherry blood type. Uh, a, that's a, that's a blood type. I don't know why I chose blood type. Sherry.gender equals female. Whenever you drop a new um, component, I've been dropping these right and left. Um, haven't really done anything. What these do is they create a new instance of a text field. You notice it gives it a name J text field one, J text field two, J text field three. It doesn't give them names like David, Sherry, and Bob, um, but just give them gives them those names. Those are instances. Um, those are classes. Those are objects that are created elsewhere. They define exactly what is a text field. And a text field, if I were to click here, has all these different elements um, about it. So that's already defined, so I don't have to do this. If I had to actually create the code for this from scratch for a J text field, um, just doing that portion would probably take me a month to do. So each time I wrote a program, I'd have to spend a month defining a J text field. Well, that's not very efficient. So what we do is we use a, a concept of object-oriented programming such that we, um, we bring this in. We bring in the code that's already defined. So anyway, uh, that's, that's what we mean by the instance. Then to run it, um, so it says call one of them, that brings a different type of input. We got line equals in dot next line. And by the way, you don't have to use in. You can use whatever variable name you want. And this is a method that's called. Um, later on today, I'm probably going to eat. I haven't thought that far. But I'm probably going to eat a salad. I don't think I'm eating healthy or anything. Salad I'm talking about is a Dylan's and I put so much salad dressing on there, I might as well eat a pizza and have, have less calories, but <laughs> I'm going I'm to eat a salad because I love those salads. I'm going to go to Dylan's. So that's a method. Method is something that you run. Uh, some task is created. It isn't an attribute or property that you're setting. And it shows you an example. Uh, this is from the book. Um, System.out. Um, type something. So it's, it's prompting there. Now here it's retrieving in dot next line uh, retrieves a string and assigns it the line and you see line up here is declares a string. String is a um, variable that can contain letters, numbers, and so forth. And then system dot out dot print line says you said and then it does a plus line that can connect concatenates those two together. And you notice up here our import java dot util dot scanner. So that shows you how you'd run it there. Do not try to put this in the GUI that we're doing. Won't work. Here's talks about the elements of the Java language from largest to smallest. You have an individual token like hour. You have an expression, like if you're multiplying hour times 60. You have a statement. Um, that's where you have an equals here, like hour equals in dot next int. Next in, in case you're wondering, we the, this previous example said next line. That brings in a string. Next in brings in an integer. Then the method, that's the next in, that's what we're calling. Remember, method is something to call, like your dot David dot eat, David dot drive, David dot um, uh, sleep. Um, those are methods, an action you perform. And then class. Um, that's kind of your entire definition. And then package. So um, I haven't said much about it, but I, I over here had to go this Kali GUI example two package and right click on it and put the code here. It would not have to be there. And it doesn't matter for these simpler programs, but if you're trying to uh, encompass all of these into a single package, then it's important you uh, put it in the appropriate place.
Okay, here's documentation that you can go to um, uh, more about Java. So I'm going to show you better documentation, in my opinion. Here's how I do literals and constants. Um, we got double uh, cm per inch equals 2.54. So here we're declaring a variable called double. Um, and we initially assign it 2.54. Um, and then we can change it. Uh, we can, or we can use another calculation, but we can change it too. Uh, cm is equal to inch times centimeters per inch. Unfortunately, that, uh, like I said, that centimeters per inch we could change, and, but we don't want it to change because the number of centimeters per inch is always 2.54, I guess. So how we do that? Down below, instead of doing double, we um, do final double. And see how that's all uppercase equals 2.54? Now first, when you put a final there and then your uh, rest of it, that uh, makes it a constant. Um, so it can't be reassigned. Now, it has uh, the, ver the variable or the name, it's not a variable anymore, it's a constant, has a name as all uppercase. You do not need to do that, but that's a popular convention. That way, when you see it in code, you know it's a constant that's not going to be changed. Um, formatting output. Uh, instead of doing print line, you do printf, and that gives you more control. Now, here's one example. And if you've taken C, um, then you know what in the world this um, is. Um, in C programming and in Java, they share the formatting of it. Um, when you do a percent and then you do F, that brings in a floating point. In this case, I'm just doing 4 divided by 3. Now, um, okay, there's a D there. Um, F is for floating point. That's where you have numbers with decimals. D is where you have an a integer. That's a number with no decimal. If you're wondering what the point three does, that's between the percent and the F, uh, that rounds it to three decimal places. So down here, we got our inch and then um, uh, centimeters equal to inch times centimeters per inch. That'd be our constant we already got defined. And then down here, we got a percent D and we got a percent F. What, it did, what it's doing, since percent D is first, this value right here is going to be plugged into the first uh, specifier. So it'll be plugged into the percent D. The centimeter will be plugged into the percent F. So however many percent Ds and percent Fs that you have in there is how many variables you have to have here at the end. Here are some examples of the specifiers. Let me grab a drink here. Percent D is your decimal integer, a uh, number with no, no uh, decimal. It's kind of weird we call it a decimal integer when I say it's a number with no decimals. <laughs> but I don't know why they chose that name. Uh, if you do a, uh, when you're using a D, if you do a 0, 8, uh, it pads of zeros. So it makes sure that it's eight digits long. Um, if you had a social security number. Um, there's a movie... Uh, Coneheads, I think it was. Really, really good movie. Um, from the 80s, 70s, 90s, something like that. And um, in the movie, um, he's he's giving them a, a social security number. And um, the um, social security number, he started, I think, going off into letters even and so forth. So then he knew it wasn't valid. We all know social security numbers have uh, what, nine nine numbers. Um, so if the the first ones are zeros, you need to actually put those for a social security number. You can't just leave those off. Otherwise, you'd say, well, you don't have enough digits. Um, there was a movie where they, the person was given their, um, oh, the um, phone number, I think. And they didn't give enough digits. So again, sometimes you have to have that many, no matter what. Percent F. 
Uh, that's our floating point. That's number with decimals. Now, if you just do a percent F, it doesn't do any kind of rounding. It may give you a lot more decimal places than you want, as you see in this example here. If you do the percent two or percent dot two, uh, then F, um, it's going to round to two decimal places. Um, now, here we got a variable called um, uh, pi. It's 3.14159. Let's say I want to convert that. Uh, to an integer. Converting in programming is referred to as cast. So I always look this up. You know, when I'm trying to figure out, when I'm in a programming language and I want to change a double to an integer, um, then uh, I always Google cast and you'll find the, the programming example on that. Different, different languages do it different ways. Google should be your best friend. Don't don't hesitate. Don't don't uh, email me first asking how to do a cast in C sharp. Google it. Um, let's see here, C sharp type casting. Um, so if I come here, Looks like uh, C sharp. You put the, if you wanted to go from a integer to a double, you uh, do the same thing as we're going to look at here in um, in Java. Um, so again, you know the key. The I'm not when I point out the word cast, it's not trivial. I'm pointing that out because if you remember that one key word, then when no matter what language you run across, if you need to switch from one data type to another data type, then that'll that'll help guide you. You still may have trouble finding it, but. Modulus is presented in section 3.8, and that returns a remainder. Um, and if we have time for uh, the example in simplifying a fraction, I'll do that. Um, but I don't think we'll get to the uh, looping construct today on that. Okay. Um, for example, 5 divided by 2 is 2 with remainder of 1. Uh, modulus returns uh, the 1. And that's what this percent does. Okay, random integers. This is what we're going to work with. So let's go back to our code now. And I'm going to put another button on here. If you're wondering, is this the proper way to design this? I don't know. Um, I'm sure some of you could come up with better designs for this. Um, I'm going to have them click this button and it'll generate two random numbers and put them here. And then the idea is they'll put the answer here, mm -hmm. click the button, and this will tell them whether it's correct or not. Okay, so I'm going to click this one, right click on it, say edit text. This will be number one. Right click on this one, edit text. This will be number two. Um, right click on this one, say edit text, I do a backspace, have a script my screen. Right click on that one, edit text, backspace. If I click down here, nothing's selected, and if I drag a rectangle, I can move those. Maybe I just don't know how to do it, um, but I don't know why it does that where it changes, changes the size of it. Like I say, maybe there's a way to change that and that doesn't. Um, I had uh, one person in IT one time. They said, um, and they, were, they were right, they're 100% correct. They said, um, you know, because I was referring to them as an expert. And they said, do you know, do you know what an expert is, David? I said, no, what is an expert? They said an expert is somebody that knows more than you. <laughs> and that's right. That's 100% correct. Um, you know, there's certifications you can get, uh, CompTIA certifications that claim you're an expert on working on a computer. Um, uh, but again, it, you know, that's a, that's a subjective standard. Um, 
Because I guarantee you that somebody that's been past the Comp CompTIA A plus certification probably doesn't know as much as somebody that's been working on them for 20 years. Um, I, I had an individual I worked with, and um, he worked on hardware, and I don't think he had any certifications. That guy, boy, he sure knew hardware. You know, worked on it for maybe worked on a lot of them in 20 years. Um, but if you work on something for 20 years, you got a down pat. Okay, this button, I'm going to right click, I'm going to say edit text, and this is going to be generate. So that's going to be our generate random numbers. Okay, so this is, um, I'm going to right click on that, say edit text, now say input, input answer. Right click on this one, say edit text, you'll tax space, shrink. Some of you have written one program in Java already. Guess what? You're an expert. Um, uh, compared to your um, significant other, your mother, your father, you're an expert in this. Right click, and then I'll call say this is check. And down here, I'm going to right click on that, say edit text, result, and right click on that, well, maybe I'll leave that alone. We'll see if I remember how to do that, that portion down there. Also, I hate this weird, weird shading it does. But, um, Okay, I right click on that. I'm going to give it a variable name. This will be called tf underscore num1. This one, I right click, uh, change variable name. You can call it whatever you want. I do tf for text field, and then whatever I'm referring to. It's just a way for me to help remember. Um, I wish this, uh, like if I go to source here, um, I wish that when I start typing, and I don't think it does in Java, I start typing TF, I wish it'd pop up with all the possibilities. Uh, maybe, maybe it does, I don't remember correctly. There's at least one package I'm using this semester that doesn't do that, and I hate it. Okay, so I want to click this, want to generate random numbers. So I'm going to right click on this and, and choose events, mouse, mouse click. And I didn't rename the button, so that's kind of a bad deal, but um, I'm going to change this code to say generate random numbers. Reason why is because I need to know where I'm coming back down to. Okay, so first thing we have to do is generate random numbers. Is we have to put this import up at the top, import java.util.random. This brings in code that somebody else has written that generates random numbers. We'll go clear to the top, and I don't remember if it needs to be above or below the package, but I think it's below. It'll give us an error if it isn't. Java dot what job what import. Well, I'm really messing it up here. Uh, import Java dot there it goes. See, it pops up, and if you start typing here, util dot, if you don't remember exactly what is it, then assuming you can get down to that far, you can figure out which uh, subcategory it falls into, then you can find a random there. I sure thought double clicking that would work. Boy, that was slow. Now that's going to bring in all of our all of our methods that we can call, um, all the definitions of our object uh, that we can work with uh, for the random. Okay, so this is why I put the code the comment here, so I know where to come back down to. So this is where I need to put my code. I talked about creating a human earlier. Um, well, this is random. And you see the random here. I'm not sure if I like their notation on that, so I'm going to probably choose something different. Um, some people like to name it the same as the, the class name, um, the random. 
uh, with a lowercase. I think it's confusing. Random R equals new random. What this uh, line does here, it creates a new instance of random, just like I created when I walked into Walmart. In the matrix of Walmart, I uh, created a new human called David. Uh, that's what we're doing there. You can give it any name you want right here. All the rest of it has to be exactly as you see it. Okay, so we're going to want to generate random numbers. Um, specifically work with integers. You see how there's a random dot next int? So um, I guess I need a couple of numbers. Num1, num2. Num1 is equal to r dot. And you see you start typing next. And uh, there's next int. You see you can also bring in a Boolean. Bytes, double, float, Gaussian, I have no clue what Gaussian is, long. Um, when you do that, it brings up uh, this right here. I thought it'd give us a little bit more, uh, but some, some are better than others in terms of documentation. We'll actually look how to make those Java docs ourselves. Now in this one, um, see how we put a hundred in there? Um, I think that'll return from zero to 99, if I remember right. Um, now the other resource I wanted to show you, hopefully it has random there. See, so this is w3schools.com. Oops, if you didn't have me in other classes, you know, I go over here a lot. Java random. And I type Java random. Don't want JavaScript. Uh, maybe I want to make luck here. It's not looking good. You have to go down that far. This, I think, is using... um using just the math, random. Yeah, it's just math. Well, it failed me there. Um, but if I want to generate uh, something between um, uh, 1 and 10, I think I put a 10 there and a plus 1. I'm going to play it to see. R.nextEnd. This will be good enough, whatever it generates, plus one. Now we need to write those out. Um, so, uh, let's see if I can remember how to do this. Uh, TF, this is where I wish it would start popping up with um, all my um, components to start with TF, but I do have them over here on the left side so I can see it easily. And if you have it sorted, if you have, T, have them starting with TF, then you'll see them all in one location. And this is TF num1 dot set text and I think this would be string dot value of yeah num one keep thinking I, I'll create a po posters to put on a wall so I can very easily cheat <laughs> go let's say okay that's how you do a do it in Java every language is a little bit different they're all full of the same principle though tf underscore num2 dot set text string dot value of. That's why I'm emphasizing so much to find a resource to go to so you can look these up quickly uh, if, you, if you are working with multiple multiple ones. Okay. Um, well, let's try it. Let's see. I've tied that to the button. Select that as my main class. Another infusion of caffeine going in. <laughs> okay, click generate three one seven two four ten. Looks like I remembered correctly. 
no time when I'm clicking that do I see zero pop up. So that's why you do the plus one. But you do see 10 appear every now and then. Now that I said that, there's 10. Don't ask me. I would never design it that way, but uh, that's how, how they did it. Um, you see there's component.java here. If I come here, you look at it, it's like, boy, this doesn't look familiar. No, that's code it brought up. Um, this isn't anything you wrote. Look how many lines of code are here. Oops. Let's see if I can see back and grab it. 10,512. I'm assuming this was uh, for, since it says component, one of the components I dropped on there, if not all of them. So in order to, um, in order to, like say, write a program completely from scratch and not use somebody else's code that they've written, I'd have to write 10,000 lines of code in order to do those uh, text fields and everything from, from scratch. Um, no place wants you to do that. That's a beauty of code reuse. That's, a, that's why these packages are so much better than back in the dark ages in the 80s. Anyway, ours is mainwindow.java. If you never, if you're ever not quite sure, you just come over here and double click it if you close it by accident. Okay, so we got that part working. So go back to design here. Now they're gonna put an answer in here. So we need to give it a name. So I'll right click on that and say change variable name. And probably a logical one is TF underscore answer. As you're writing a program, your whole goal should be to write it such that if you pick it up five years from now, you know exactly what you're doing code-wise. Um, make your life easy, not harder. Okay, and this button, I'll go ahead and do it the correct way now. I'll say change variable name. I'll call this button check. We're not going to refer to it in code, but then when I'm looking at the, the source over here, when I see this, I have no clue what that means. <laughs> uh, button two, what's button two? Um, you know, you could put code down, or comment down here, but by just uh, naming them the proper proper name over here, we're gonna see it's gonna make something a little bit more um, easy to read, self-documents. Here's where I'm gonna put my results. So let me call this, uh, I'm gonna do a right click on that, change variable name, I'll call that LB underscore result, LB for label. You don't have to use my conventions, but you should develop some kind of convention so you can easily see um, and understand what they are you're dealing with. If I'm in code and I see LB, I know, right. okay, that's a label. Um, label, they can't input anything into. If I see TF, I know that's a text field. I know they can input something into a text field. Okay, so now I want to program the check. So I'm going to right click on that, choose events, mouse, mouse click. Notice my button, button check. Okay, so now it says self-document and what in the world that's doing, uh, that's checking. Now probably naming it something a little bit more meaningful, my check answer <laughs> might be, might have been better, but we'll go with what I did since, since I did do it that way. I need to retrieve their answer. So I'm gonna retrieve it and we're working with integers, though you could do these as doubles too. And so num is going to equal to, uh, let me think how to do this. It's either int, integer spelled out, int32. Let's try integer spelled out. Parse it. Okay, it was integer spelled out. Parse int. And then um, I'm going to have tf underscore answer dot get, get text. I would encourage you when you first learn a program to type everything out. Do not use edit copy and edit paste. Edit copy and edit paste doesn't exist. Um, the more you type it, the more it'll uh, become an, uh, common. So you can just you can just type without even thinking. Um, so if you got if you got five of those you bring in, type all of them out completely. Okay, so we just brought that number in. I need to bring in the other two numbers so I can then uh, check them and say. It's a tutorial about adding the numbers together. So I need to know what the answer is going to be. Oh, my. Oh, that was 
Bleak or not Bleak Nick? Missing. <laughs> okay. So um, I need my answer, and I'm also going to bring in. Um, you know, Num is pretty poor thing to call it. Their guess, or their answer, or user answer, or user answer. Okay, so that's what the user is going to answer. Then we need the real answer. So I need to bring in num1 and num2. So num1 is going to equal to integer.parseInt. Cf underscore what I call num1, I'm assuming. Uh, get text. Get text gets whatever's in the text field. Num2 is equal to integer.parseInt. TF underscore num2 dot get name. Where in the world did that come from? Gremlins in the system. So then my my real answer is going to equal to num1 plus num2. Now think about how you do this in real life. And here we're gonna we're gonna introduce a new uh, new construct, an if statement. But in real life, I'd say, okay, uh, let me give you two numbers, two plus three, and I'd say, what's the answer? And um, so in my head, um, you know, I'm thinking two plus three. I've stored that off. You tell me the answer is uh, seven, and I think, okay, uh, they said seven. Uh, the the actual answer is two plus three, which is five. So what I'm doing in real life is what I just did here. So I'm thinking, okay, the answer is five. So now I need to check to see if the answer is the same. We're gonna we're gonna be exploring this a lot more in future future classes, but it's was, it was such so little material in that chapter three. I wanted to include the other other items in here. Uh, the if else. The if else allows us to do comparisons and. Uh, don't worry too much about it now, but the general syntax of it is if you got if and then you got inside parentheses your condition and then uh, curly brace and closing curly brace. Um, if I'm hungry, I'll eat a Dylan's later, uh, a salad. Uh, if I go to Crit Trip, um, then I'll eat a turkey sandwich. I like their turkey sandwiches or bacon. Uh, same principle holds true here. So I'm going to check if the user answer is equal to the answer. Now notice what I did here. I put two equals in Java, and, and don't get stressed out about this because we're going to we're going to build upon this. Um, but in Java, um, checking if something's equal is done with two equals like that. Now this returns something called a boolean: user answer equals equals answer. Uh, Boolean is, it's going to be either true or false. So this means I got the answer right. So you can put the curly braces here, like that. Actually, if you have one line of code, you don't need to do that. And then where I'm going to put my result, lb underscore result dot text, text, no, set text. Correct. Now you're saying, well, last time we just looked at text fields. We didn't look at labels. When you're working with a label and you're sending a text on it, um, it's the same principle as a text field. You do a dot set text. It has to bring in a string, which is why you have to do a string dot value of if it's in a number of some sort. Now here, I did not need to do a string dot value of because I'm actually typing this uh, uh, text there. Now, if it's not correct, that means it's wrong. And how you do that is with an else. And then I'll put the beginning brace and it puts a closing brace for me. LB underscore result dot set text. In this case, I couldn't have left a big E there. Wrong.
Okay, so the code's work coming down here. It's getting the user answer. It's getting the real answer. Let's say you said seven, the answer is five. It's checking to see if this is true. Well, seven is not equal to five. So since that's false, it comes down to this else statement here and does this line of code. Now let's say I ask you what two plus three is and you tell me five. So it comes up here, you said five, the actual answer is five. Since five is equal to five, that's true, which means it'll do this line of code. And after it does that line of code, it immediately drops down after the uh, closing brace of this else and continues, uh, which there is no other code. Uh, but that's how an if else works. Have to have the parentheses around whatever you're checking and then your variable and then um, some kind of uh, op or operator here, which we'll see, and then some kind of variable or number here. Let's run this and see if it works. Okay, so let's say generate 18, that's 22. Oh boy, I'm bad. Two, that's gotta be 11. Uh, that's not good. Okay, nine. <laughs> Didn't mean to get that one wrong. That's, that's correct. Okay, now let's say we want to uh, expand this and I want to keep track of my score. Okay, so let's go back to our main window.java here. Go back to my design. And I'm going to keep a score down here in the very bottom. This is going to introduce a new concept with variables. And a label, because I don't want them to be able to change it. Right click on this. Choose edit text. And this will be a score. And initially, um, Initially, it's zero. Edit text, zero. I don't think you can resize that. Yeah, yeah, you can. Never mind. But you need to know the score out of how many. Um, so that's why I drew, I drew a blank there because I was thinking, uh, do I do percents or do I, what, what should I do exactly? Um, but I'll drop another label on here. Uh, I'll call this total number of problems. So right click on that, edit text, total number of problems. It's probably a short way to express, express that count, <laughs> but, um, And I'll right click on this, say edit text, and it's zero to begin with. Okay, now I need to give these names. So this one, J label six is not very meaningful. So I'll right click on that to change the variable name. I'll call it LB underscore score. This one, right click it, right click on that, change the variable name. I'll call it LB underscore uh, count. Okay, so in my code, if they get it right, I want to increase this by one, and then um, uh, always increase this by one. Different ways you can do this. You can retrieve the value that's already there and add based upon it. That's one way. Another way is you could define a um, variable up here at the top. So I could define one up at this level. Um, I think I could put it right here. Maybe we'll put it there. That way we can see if I'm putting it in the right place. <laughs> I don't use Google variables a whole lot. Integer score is equal to zero. Integer total count. Total, I'll just total count. What am I doing? Count is equal to zero. So you may wonder, well, you're you declared it up here. What what's the difference? Um, this will keep track of the score um throughout my entire program the way that um the way the button works the 
when you click this button here and it runs this code, it assigns this a memory location um, in RAM for num1 and num2. So it says, hey, I need, I need some memory. And um, it says, okay, you can have this one and this one in the RAM. And you say, fantastic. Uh, comes down here, finds a value, and then it puts that value in that memory location in RAM. We're good. Does num2, does the same thing. When this, uh, this gets done running, this method um, gets done running, then it releases this. It says to the program, hey, we don't need num1 and num2 anymore. You, you, you can have it back. And so it's, we're done with it which means you cannot access these variables outside of this method. Um, by putting them up here at the top, this is uh, saying to the program, hey, um, we're gonna need this and um, we're gonna use it while the entire program is running because I'm declaring it up here. Now you might think we'll put everything up here. No, that's bad coding. These are called global variables. Uh, their scope is global. They're, you can use them every, anywhere. When you put them in an individual method, like I did down below, that's a local variable. You can only use that variable in that in that method. So you can't use it anywhere outside of that method. And when it gets done running that method, then it's released. Um, don't use global variables uh, extensively. Is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Let me see. What's that called? Score and count. Uh, in case you're wondering, well, I didn't write all this. No, you didn't. You can collapse it by clicking the minus here. Um, collapse it or expand it? Okay, yeah. Minus uh, collapses it. So if you're getting tired of scrolling through those, <laughs> you only want your code showing. That's how you. That's how you hide some of that. Okay. Um, where are those initial components? Where's that at? Oh, it expanded that. Okay. Where in the world's my check? Here's my check, the one that says button check. So if the answer is correct, then I want to say the score is equal to score plus one. No matter what, I want to increase the count. So if they go into that, that button and click it, I want to increase the count. Now here at the end, after this else, I'm going to update the labels for those. So lb underscore score dot set text string dot value of, I'm going to call it score. I screwed something up here. String value of score. Add set text. Check out the nursing home today. LB underscore score. I'm sure the program did that. I'm sure I didn't. <laughs> Blame it on the computer if nothing else. Not score. Why am I doing score again? Uh, count. Okay, so let's see how that works. Okay, so generate random numbers. Five, six, and um, let me see, what is that, one? Total number problem one. Let's generate. Seven plus nine is 16. One out of two. Five plus seven is two. Oh, I'm not doing very good. Nine plus one is 91. Boy, I need, I need a lot of help here. Okay, we see it's working. Um, so this is this is how you can create a tutorial. Now for the project this week, 
I want you to create a tutorial, but I want you to, um, and it, it's going to be your choice on how to design it. Um, I want you to have not only addition, but subtraction, multiplication, and division. Well, how can you do that? Well, you could have four parts to your screen and just repeat the, the, the code four times. Um, no, don't worry about division. Uh, subtraction, uh, addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Um, division has a problem where you'd have to make sure that it divides into it evenly if you're talking about integers. <laughs> um, otherwise, then we'd have to talk about rounding, and I wasn't going to go into that this time. Um, there's clever ways you could do it. You could use these same two uh, boxes here, but you could have three buttons over here. Check addition, check subtraction, check multiplication. And um, you could have this down here, have three lines, one for the addition score, one for the subtraction score, one for the multiplication score. Your choice. Um, sometimes you have a user that will tell you exactly what they want. I mean, they'll give you a hand-drawn uh, sketches of what they want it to look like, what they want it to do. They'll give you everything to the, to the detail that you couldn't imagine. Other times you'll have a user that says, uh, well, I, I don't really care what it looks like. Uh, that's that's the person who doesn't use it on a day-to-day -day basis. That's like a manager. And they know that their um, their employee needs a tutorial for addition, subtraction, and multiplication. And personally, they, they could care less. You know, they'll they'll come back at you later. <laughs> say, you know, your program is really not very user-friendly. You didn't tell me any kind of specifications. Um, but... Um, you know, sometimes they leave it up to you. So you have to decide. And that's what I'm telling you. I'm not going to tell you what the screen's going to look like. I told you what I want. I want uh, some kind of tutorial such that I can do the addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Um, anyway, uh, that's a project project for the uh, for this week. Is there any questions on anything? And by the way, I, will, I won't come back at you for your design, not unless you make it a bright red that hurts my eyes. I'm sitting there working it. <laughs> well, you know, changing the background color would be kind of cool for when you get the problem wrong. Um, but uh, you don't have to do that. I'm not even sure if I know how to do that myself. Um, changing the color of background. Shouldn't look in the book for that. If you're using Java, and I'm going to say NetBeans, changing uh, color of the form. Here's a YouTube video. It tells you in a 1 minute and 36 seconds uh, how you would change the color of the background color. Now, whether that's programmically, um, I don't know. Um, but there's some other ones there. Um, I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just saying that um, you should be careful with researching it yourself um, when you're doing coding. It's not stealing coding. Um, stealing coding would be copying the entire code and then turning it in. <laughs> Coming out here and stealing one, two lines of code is fine. You know, you don't even have to reference where you got it from. Um, um, everybody that's in this program is going into going to computer science. Um, if you're going to copy code, you're going to fail when you go, go into the job market. You're going to be unemployed. Uh, you'd be asking me if I want fries with my cheeseburger. Um, so people are a lot more serious about doing the coding themselves in this. You don't see the cheating like you might in like an English comp class. Um, because they know that this is training so they'll be successful in their, their job, you know, directly in their job. By the way, um, we'll stop there. Um, that's the assignment and have a good Friday and good weekend.